Well, if you take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 8, as you view it there in your bulletin on the back of the bulletin, we try to try to most weeks provide you with a uh, outline. I think we've done that this morning in the back of the bulletin. If you'll notice this morning, this morning's title in the gospel according to Mark is He Cares. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 9. Uh, verse 10 is kind of a continuation into the next passage of scripture there, so we're going <clears> to <throat> leave that one out, although I think it's listed in your bulletin this morning. Isn't it good to be able to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Isn't it good that the house of the Lord is air conditioned? <laughs> yeah. Man, it was hot yesterday. I was telling some people that I was out driving around yesterday during the hottest part of the day. It was so hot. Someone said, how hot was it? I saw a uh, snake crossing the road and it had a canteen. <laughs> That's how hot it was. I also saw a dog chasing a cat and they were both walking. You know it's hot when that happens, right? Notice the passage of Scripture, Mark 8, 1. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will faint on the way, for some of them have come from afar off. Then his disciples answered, How can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? He asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. He commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he he took the seven loaves, and he gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And they set them before the multitude. They also had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he he set them also before them. And so they ate and were filled. They took up seven large baskets of leftover fragments. Now those who had eaten were about 4,000, and then he sent them away. Let's, let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the scripture that has been preserved throughout the centuries. Thank you that we have reliable English, English translations. And thank you that we can read from the word and, and be blessed by the content, be blessed by what the um, evangelists were communicating from the written word as they were revealed to write by the scriptures, by the Holy Spirit. Thank you for this morning, for those who are here, for those who are now. We do think of Cody, who left us last week for school and uh, I know he misses us. He's texted a few of us a few times. We just pray for your guidance and direction over him. Help him to find a good Bible-believing, solid evangelical church. And uh, we pray for you, the, the blessing of your Holy Spirit as he guides and directs us this morning through our passage. In Christ's name we pray, amen. If you'll notice in your outline there this morning, if you're looking in the back of your bulletin, as I mentioned earlier, we start with the crowd as far as an introduction is concerned. The crowd, uh, Mark likes to mention the crowd. He also likes to use the word immediately. And so he's he's mentioning the crowd there in verse 1. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them. And so there's the crowd. There's a reference to the crowd. As we've seen from sermons past, we see this. Mark can be brief in some of his narration. Uh, but here he's, he's given us great detail over what was happening in this particular day. A large crowd. Matthew gives even more detail as far as the passage is concerned. Matthew describes even within the crowd what was happening that day. Um, Mark just says the crowd and then he goes right into the detail. But uh, Matthew gives us more detail. In other words, what was happening during the three days that they were with Jesus. If you look there in that passage, Matthew mentioned, or Jesus mentions three days, that they have been with him for three days, and obviously for three days they haven't had much to eat. Some people probably brought food with them. It was customary for people to carry a small sack, kind of like some people do today, a small bag that they, for provisions, but three days out in the wilderness 
it was probably all gone. A lot of them hadn't eaten. Matthew gives us more detail about what was going on that way in that day. So let's go there and take a look in Matthew 15 this morning. Matthew 15. By the way, we're having a real awesome time on Wednesday nights. If you hadn't had an opportunity to come, we'd sure like you to be there. We do have an air conditioner in the parsonage. In fact, it's new. Last summer it broke, so we purchased a new one. So it's nice and cool in the parsonage. We'd like you to be there. I think we had 16 or 17 this last week. It's always good to sit around and talk and eat and fellowship and have sweets and have salad until we can't have any more. That's always good. And then to get into the Word, going through John 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. And so we're looking at that. We have a few younger couples coming too, as well as a couple of older couples. Teens, you are also invited. If you'd like to come, feel free to come. Bring your Bible. If you're a teenager and you don't have access to a salad or a, a, a sweet dish, don't worry. There's always plenty. And uh, we'd still want the teens to come if they want to do that. I think it'd be okay with our youth pastor, right? All right, good. So if you'd like to come, that's right over here next to the little white church. That's the parsonage. If you have a imperial, you know where it is. And we still have room for you. It's a blessing to get together during the week. Notice Matthew 15, verses 29 through 31. Verse 29, Jesus departed from there, skirted the Sea of Galilee, and went up on the mountain and sat there. Then a great multitude came to him. See, we're getting a little bit more detail here than what Mark gave us. Then a great multitude came to him, having with them the lame, the blind, the mute, the maimed, and many others, Matthew says, and they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. And so the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking, the blind seeing, and they glorified God. And if you were here last week, you'll take notice from the passage that Mark omits this, uh, that Matthew details out. Mark only mentions the deaf mute, if you were here last week, the deaf mute. But here we see that every kind of ailment was dealt with by Jesus. And I'm sure there was more and how do we know there was more, as Matthew records there? How do we know there were more than just the ones he listed? Many other, see that in verse, um, verse 30 there, I think it is, is that right, verse 30? Many others, many other types of ailments, many other groups of people, a large multitude. Jesus was dealing with and preaching to for three days straight in the wilderness, healing all kinds of diseases, even ones that aren't listed there, both Mark and Matthew mention the crowd so that we can see the extent of the miracle Jesus performs when he feeds them. Kind of like the feeding of the 5,000. You know, I, just, just in chapter 6, we're in chapter 8, just in chapter 6, we looked at the feeding of the 5,000. How many of you were here when we went through the feeding of the 5,000? So I was actually contemplating skipping over this passage. I said, I thought to myself, well, there's such a similarity here. Why don't I just skip over it? But I wasn't able to skip over it. As I looked at it, I realized there's not similarity. There's similarity, but there's, other, there's, there's, an other, there's more point being made here, other things to see that Mark obviously wanted us to see, that the Holy Spirit, of course, wants us to see regarding the feeding of the 4,000 that was different than the feeding of the 5,000. Miraculously multiplying seven loaves of bread and a few small fish. And so like the feeding of the 5,000, this miracle, the feeding of the 4,000, is huge. Because again, they're not counting women and children that were there. They didn't count them. So this is huge. Multiplying seven loaves of bread and a few small fish. So way over 4,000 were fed. And it stretches the imagination to think about that. Can you begin to think about the implication of feeding 4,000 men plus the women and children that were there? We're looking at 18,000, 20,000, 30,000 altogether. That's a lot, right? With seven loaves, could you feed that many people? I know some of you women are pretty good in the kitchen and really good at, my wife's really good at stretching stuff out, you know. She'll cook a big meal and then we'll eat it for several days after that. Right? How many of you women do that? Make a big meal, and then we have it for breakfast with an egg. We'll have it on a sandwich for lunch. 
right? Change up the variation a little bit. And can you imagine feeding over 4,000, maybe 18, 20, 25,000 people with seven loaves and a few small fish? Not the big fish, the small fish. So it stretches the imagination. Everyone there recognized the enormity of the miracle. And I think Mark wants us to recognize it too. You could only attribute its wonder to the God of Israel. And we see that expressed in the passage as well. This is God doing this. This is incredible. This is awesome. This has got to be God, right? There are no other gods. There's only one God, amen? There's only one God, only the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God that we see in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, who is a spirit who moved over the face of the, uh, the earth, and over the face of the water. There's only one God, that God, Jehovah God, the Almighty, Yahweh. He is this God, and he's manifested himself on earth in human form, in the person of Jesus Christ. Yet those that day didn't take it that far. As far as they could see, Jesus was an instrument of God, much like Moses. They were attributing the great miracles that Jesus was doing as though God was working through Jesus on the same level as Moses. Moses was not God. He was a human instrument, a great man of God, a man who spoke to God face to face like one man speaks to another. But he who wasn't like Jesus... The Gospels are clear to present Jesus as the Son of God, but not only as the Son of God, but God incarnate, or God in human form. The scriptures are very clear to do that. This is why he performed such miracles. And the greatest he performed was the forgiveness of sin. That is the greatest miracle that Jesus performed while on earth. Forgive sin. Moses didn't forgive any sin. Jesus did and does. Now, Jesus' miraculous power was the reason for such... Large crowds, if you were sick, he could heal you, no problem at all. He could do that. If you were in danger, he could protect you, and he did that with a lot of them. With the 12, he protected them. They were in danger on the sea, if you remember, in danger of drowning. He protected them, didn't he? He stopped the storms. If you were in bondage to demons, he could free you. We've already seen that. He had... No problem with confronting demonic possession and casting out demons. He can cast, he could even cast out thousands in one person. He knew no bounds when it came to his authority and power over the demonic world. If you were enslaved to sin, he could set you free. He could set you free. If you were dead, he could raise you back to life again. And if you were poor, he would preach to you the riches of God's kingdom. And if you were hungry, guess what? If you were hungry, he could feed you. No wonder the crowds were so big, right? No wonder the crowds were so big. All these things could take place in the presence of Jesus, including providing a meal for you. And I believe he did this more often than it is recorded in Scripture. There were a lot of times when people needed to eat and the Lord provided for them, I'm sure. These are just small pictures of what Jesus did while he was ministering the three years that he ministered as the Son of God. And so the crowds were so big because of that. Jesus was a man that could meet every human need, not to mention the needs of the soul. Every human need, including the soul. But that's... That really isn't so much the point of the passage. It's not. Although it's there and though it's prevalent, and it's what most people tend to focus on when they look at the passage, the miracle of feeding the 4,000, not counting the women and children, that is not really the heart of the passage, Je that Jesus could miraculously meet both human and spiritual needs. That is very important in understanding his deity and understanding his identity that he is God in human form, thus the Lord and the Savior. It is very important that we understand that. But in my mind, the point of the passage is that he cares. It's resounding in the passage. In fact, right, right off the bat, we begin to see that, right? Jesus cares. This is what Mark wants us to understand. He 
This is what the Holy Spirit wants us to see, that he cares. Why else would he feed so many people when you think about it, right? Why would he feed so many people? He, he, it, the whole idea that, that the Lord cares, that God cares, that Jesus cares is implied in the passage because he says, I can't let them go out. I can't let them go out and, and, and fend for themselves. Too many of them traveled too far. They'll faint on the way. We all got to have a little nourishment in our belly before we go somewhere, right? And we do that before we went into the ball game. I think it saved us a lot of money too, probably. <laughs> Hot dogs, $22 or whatever it was, right? Seemed like it. I don't know what they were. I didn't buy one. But I know that a small bag of peanuts was two fifty or four fifty. What was it? Yeah, they don't even shell them for you. Why else would he feed so many? You know, the miracles of, of forgiveness, of raising the dead, healing the sick, would be enough. It really would be enough. It is enough to say that he is God. It is. But a desire to feed a want and a desire to feed? Doesn't God feed the sparrows? How many birds do you see standing in the welfare line? They all eat. All the little sparrows, all the birds eat. And they're, they're not going to Walmart and pushing a grocery. The desire for God the creator to feed his creation. That is a caring God. Right? To want to put... Food in the mouth of those he ministers to. That, that tells me that he cares. He really cares. I remember as a teen, my mother feeding my friends. How many of you had mothers that would feed all your friends that came over? Right? Yeah, that's a mother who cares. It really is. And one of them that came, he came from a broken home with a mother that was pretty much non-existent. The mom and dad were divorced. That was really kind of rare in my day back in the 70s. But we did have, I did have one friend who didn't have a father at home, and his mother was out doing things. Uh, and so he always wanted me to know how lucky I was. He always used to say that. When we'd come to the house, we'd get ready to go somewhere. My mom would say, sit down, you're going to eat before you go. Well, we're in a hurry. I don't care if you're in a hurry. Sit down, you're going to eat. I've already made something to eat. Sit down, you're going to eat before you go. And so she'd fill me up, and she'd fill my friend up. And he always wanted, to know, wanted me to know how lucky I was because I had a mother that cared. That's what he wanted me to know. You're lucky, man. You've got a mom that cares. My mom doesn't even know when I eat or if I even eat. She's never around. If she wasn't out working. She was out around, so to speak. Him and his brother had to fend for themselves a lot. I had a mother that not only cared that I ate, but I had a mother that cared that my Hungry friends ate as well. And this is what's being expressed in Matthew 15 and in Mark 8. It's where we see Jesus going the extra mile. He's already healed them all of all their diseases. There was no one sick any longer. And if that wasn't enough, he wants to feed them. He wants to feed them, right? He goes the extra mile. Not only is he performing miracles... But when it's all said and done and there's no one else to heal and the party's over, rather than let them go to fend for themselves, the Lord wants to send them off with a full belly. He does. I think that's awesome. That takes us to point number one. Are you there? His compassion. Verse 2 and 3 of Mark 8. He said to them, I have compassion. I have compassion. I've put that in bold print there and highlighted it. Highlighted it there. I have compassion. This is the Lord speaking. I, if, it's, if it's in red, you'll see it there in your Bible. I have compassion on the multitudes because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will faint on the way. For some of them have come from afar, long distant. And here it is right in front of us in black and white or in red and white, depending on the type of Bible you have, he cares. He really cares for us. He really cares. If you ever wondered if God really cares, by his own confession, what does he say? What does he say there? I have compassion. I have compassion. 
if he wasn't already dispensing compassion, if he wasn't already demonstrating compassion by the healing and the preaching and the desire to see them come to be saved. He says he has it, and then what does he do? He demonstrates it, right? It's not just lip service. He's not just saying, I have compassion, and then let them go away and starve. How many of you know that say they love you? Right? They say they love you. That they care for you. But it's only in word and it's not in deed, right? In today's world is so easy to express emotionally how we feel, but there's never any action to go with it, right? There's never any proof to back it up. Real compassion, obviously, real compassion is motivated to action. And here the Lord not only says it, he proves it. He acts on his word. He does it ultimately when he takes our sin upon himself on the cross and he dies there in our place, taking the penalty of our sin upon himself. He ultimately displays his compassion for us in that way. But here Mark wants us to understand that he did it in the human, on the human level as well, probably on a regular basis, a man who cared for his people. Here in Mark 8, he shows or acts out his care or his compassion by not allowing the crowd to go without eating first. I think that's so awesome. Especially when I can relate that to when I was a young boy or a teenager, I guess, young man. And remember, my mom was so compassionate that way, so not wanting me to go anywhere before I had something to eat. Now, I took that for granted. It was an interruption in my in my plan, you know, I was a, I come home from school, change, get ready to go somewhere. Oh, wait a minute, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. I'm in a hurry. It's all right. You need to eat before you go. There was all kinds of reasons behind my mom wanting to do that, but deep seated inside of her, I'm sure, was that motherly instinct that made sure that her little bird ate before he went somewhere. Right? Boy, was I a little bird when I was in high school. Not allowing the crowd to go without eating first. And I just put a note here. The Lord's concern and care for his people was a common occurrence in the Old Testament. We see this same God in the Old Testament. The same caring, concerning, providing God in the Old Testament, don't we? That's how we can link the deity of Christ to Jesus. Same attributes as the God of the Old Testament is embodied in Christ. He provides for the children of Israel with daily manna during the wilderness wandering, right? He was faithful to provide for them food in the mornings. They could go out and pick it up. It was just out there. Gather it up, right? And they could make whatever they wanted out of it. Manna bagels, manna waffles, banana bread, manna burgers. Later, he provides for Jacob's family through Joseph. Do you remember that? During the famine, during the terrible drought and famine in Egypt, David never went hungry. David never went hungry. King David never went hungry when he and his mighty men were running from King Saul. He never went hungry. It was always provision for David. And he provided for the four lepers. Remember that? How many remember that? When he provided for the four lepers, when they stumbled upon the desert in the, de in the desert, the Syrian encampment. How many of you remember that? Yeah. There was a drought. People were starving and hungry. They stumbled upon this Syrian encampment, and there they found it empty. And there was all kinds of food, amongst other things. They had, they had to decide if we stay here or do we go tell our people, what do we do, right? They would have starved had the Lord not. And then he provided for the widow and her son through Elijah. Did he not? He did. During another time during drought. Provided for Elijah using what? How did he provide for Elijah? The ravens. The ravens. Remember the ravens brought him food when he was lying along the brook Cherith. Plenty of water. Plenty of food. And here in Mark 8, what does he do? He feeds them by multiplying what they already had. Why? Because he cares. He cares. Because he cares. Look what he says there. I have compassion on the multitude. Right? 
because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. In other words, they're here because of me. If I were not here, they would not be here. I can't let them go. They're here because of me. It's my responsibility to take care of their needs because they're here because of me. I can't let them go. You know, there's something to say about a full belly, right? How many of you like the feeling of a full belly? How many of you like the feeling of an empty belly? Anyone? You like the feeling of an empty belly? When my stomach gets empty, it really hurts. It makes a lot of noise. Right? I try to keep it full. I know I don't look like I keep it full, but I try to. Something about a full belly, right? The Lord takes pleasure in such things, and so do we. He takes pleasure in, a, in us having a full belly. I see how, um, how, we, how we Christians... I see how we love Christian fellowship, eating, filling our bellies at our Wednesday night small group. Those of you who have been attending, you see how everybody enjoys that, right? Everybody enjoys the eating. We do. We enjoy it. In our Wednesday night small group, there's, there's something about eating together and then sharing the word together. The Lord healed them, and then what did he do? He filled them. He healed them, and he filled them. Why? Because he has compassion, because he cares about such things. And what's one of the last things that he does when he's on earth? What's one of the last things that he does in context when we think about it? First, he has a supper with the disciples. It's one of the last things he does. He has a supper with his disciples. What time of the day is supper? Nighttime? Is that the same as a dinner? Or is that at lunchtime? I don't want to split the church in half, right? So he has supper with his disciples. It's known as the Last Supper. Later, after his resurrection, he meets with his disciples on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. He does. And what's there waiting for them? Breakfast. Do you see that? He has a dinner with them before he dies. After he rises from the dead, he meets them on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And there, waiting for them on a fire, is a breakfast. Let's go there for just a minute. John chapter 21. John chapter 21. Nothing excited me more than to just to go over the passage over and over again and to begin to see what the Lord was saying from this passage, that he cares for us. He cares for it. Then I began to see it in pattern form all over the Bible. This desire to provide. Desire to provide for his people. And then this, this desire to be in fellowship from the Lord and with his people. And always surrounded the fellowship was what? Food. Food. Tomorrow we're having a meeting and we're going we're gonna to center around pizza. Yesterday we had a work day and we ended and we centered around sandwiches. First Sunday of every month is potluck Sunday, right? Or is it the second Sunday? John 21, notice verses 1 through 14. Look at, look at the scriptures here. I actually came to tears when I was reading this. I probably won't this morning because I already did it. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. That's the Sea of Galilee, okay? And in this way, look what he says, and in this way he showed himself how? By preparing for them breakfast, right? That's what he says. This is what Peter, this is what uh, John wants us to see, that the Lord showed himself this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, those are the sons of thunder, and the two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we're going to go with you also. So they went out immediately and got into the boat, and, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? You see, he cares, right? Of all things, of all things that he asks them, do you have any food? What he asked them. And they answered him, No, 
He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And so they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, that's John, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he had removed it. In other words, he was basically in a, what you would call a swimsuit probably, or his underwear. He plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with the fish. Then as soon as they had come to the land, they saw what? A fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many the net was not broken, and Jesus said to them, Come, eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord, Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Isn't it comforting to know that he cares so much, that he reveals his compassion after the resurrection? In this way? Isn't that comforting? Preparing and providing a morning meal for those that he loves. Now there's one more place I want you to go that shows his compassion in this way. We see it demonstrated in Mark 8. Okay? But I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 3. That which we see demonstrated in Mark 8, in the same way that we see it demonstrated in Mark 8, I want you to see it in Revelation 3. Verse 20. He says in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and what? Sup or dine and he with me. Do you remember the days when when family Im- intimacy was best expressed around the table. Remember those days? When family intimacy and fellowship between parents and children was around the table? Not in front of the TV. TV trays was probably the worst invention that it could have ever come out. It separated and divided the family. How many people remember when the TV trays came out? (laughs) I remember that. Here the Lord expresses that same desire. See this? Mark is so good expressing the human side of Christ. Here he describes a personal relationship with him like it is when we gather around a table. It's like family dinner time. No wonder so much of what we do as people on earth is surrounded around eating or dining. I mean, that's human characteristic. Surrounded around, surrounded or centered on eating or dining, as the Lord says. Dying there in the Greek, diepneo in the Greek, to sup, to make a meal, to take, to take the chief meal, to dine or supper, here in particular, supping, supping. This specific meaning occurs in Mark 22, 20. It says, likewise, he also took the cup after supper. You say, but I thought the theme was compassion, not fellowship. Right? The Lord expresses his compassion by not only providing, but sharing the meal with them. That's what he does. Sharing the meal with him. I think it's wonderful. Do you think he provided it but didn't eat with him? Do you think he did that? you think he provided it but didn't eat with him? I think he ate with him. He ate with him, right? I think it's very safe to say that his compassion included dining with him, especially after seeing in Revelation 3.20 that he desires such a thing. He desires to dine with us. In fact, his relationship is like that. When a person comes to faith in Jesus Christ, it's like that. It's like 
dinner time, family time, sitting around the table, enjoying conversation with those you love, personal relationship. I believe the Lord was here today. I believe that if he was here today, that he'd have no problem with attending one of our potlucks. Really? I think he would have no problem with attending one of our potlucks. He would want to go, right? He would. I think he would. And what do we see in heaven? A great banquet that he's prepared for those who love him. There's a great banquet being prepared up there for those who love him. It's heading in the future. Oh, I bet that's going to be good. I wonder if all the angels will bring all the meals. It'll be a giant potluck, right? And the angels will bring it. So as we can see, the Lord, by his own confession and demonstration, has great compassion for us. Both Matthew and Mark show it to us by his compassion and care in feeding 4,000. So much so in this passage that he won't let them go without first feeding them. And that's a, that's a good segue into the next passage. You see it there? Chapter 2, the condition, verse 4 in Mark 8, then his disciples answered him, how can one satisfy these people with bread in the wilderness? That's a good question, isn't it? I believe back in Mark 6, when Jesus fed the 5,000, the disciples expressed a lack of faith when faced with such a large and hungry crowd. But here it's a little bit different. The, the, the phrasing is different. The attitude is different. It's very different. This is not a lack of faith. This is a, a play on words, I believe it is. It's a little bit different. Last time they suggested that the people go and buy their own food. Secondly, they proposed to go into town themselves and buy provisions. That's what they were saying. Here it's very different, right? Here they simply state the condition. How can one satisfy these people here in the wilderness? They already know the answer to the question, right? They already know the answer to the question. How do they know the answer to the question? They know it by experience. He's done this before. He has fed over 5,000. Here there's a little bit less. They know it because they've seen it for themselves over and over again. They have seen that he does all things well. They were simply, even profoundly, stating that the condition was beyond their ability. That's what they were doing. This is, this is beyond our ability, just like it was before. It's beyond our ability. I believe this time it was an expression of faith, not in their ability, but in the Lord's ability. And I also believe this is where faith takes off. This is where faith takes flight. This is where the passage becomes applicable to you and to me. If you don't get anything else today, I want you to get this. Because this is very important to us right here in Imperial, sitting in Imperial Community Church, living within the community. I believe this was an expression of faith, not in their ability, but in the Lord's ability. And I'll say it again, I also believe this is where faith takes flight. This is how faith is expressed. This is how faith is exercised. When you and I come to realize that we can do nothing apart from the Lord, that's when faith is exercised. And in doing so, we experience what the Lord can and wants to do for us. I think there's a lot that God, I know there's a lot, there's everything that God can do and a lot He wants to do. But we just have the wrong idea. And the wrong focus. And so he just doesn't do. I think it's until we don't have the answer anymore. And we don't realize that it's not it. And we, and we realize that it's not me. I'm not the answer. My job is not the answer. My ability to, to uh, bring an income is not the answer. God has brought income to me that I have not earned in large amounts and in many different ways that I have not earned, that this church has not written a check to me for. 
God has brought food to my house that I didn't go out and buy. God's done some amazing things in our little life. And it's, it's not until we come to a place in our lives, sometimes of desperation, and we stop looking around and start looking up. That's what the apostles did. They looked around. Jesus, this time Jesus makes the reference, right? So when you and I come to realize, to the realization that we can do nothing apart from the Lord, and it was like this for the disciples, they had to depend daily on the Lord's power. We've had it so good in this country that we really don't know what living by faith is. We don't. Everything is handed to us. We can drive through almost anything now to get it if we need it, right? Drive through. We're so secure in our lives, so secure in ourselves, that they had to rely daily, even moment by moment on the Lord. And so you see, the apostles were expressing faith in verse 4. By this time, they knew where the answer was or who the answer was. That's the key to any dilemma, any difficulty, any challenge, any trial, that we learn not to lean on our own ability, which is kind of feeble, really, when you think about it, but on the one who is able. And how do we know this is an expression of faith and not a lack of faith? How do we know that? How do we know it? Look closer at verse 4. Then his disciples answered him. In chapter 6, they they reacted first before Jesus ever said anything. This time they respond to his question. He was seeing if they would look to him this time. And they do. They do. He, he, he makes reference to the crowd. And, and they look to him and say, it's impossible. This is an impossible situation. And they look to him. They wait for him to answer. You see that? And immediately following verse 4 is verse 5 where Jesus responds. And this tells me that they were deferring to him in verse 4. However, Mark 6, they were trying to uh, kind of come up with the solution themselves. And so the, one of the key sub points in the passage of Scripture is that we got a group of men who've learned something very important. Something very important. They learned the lesson that without Christ, they can do nothing that Christ needs to be the center of their being. Oh, yes, God provides. He does. He provides. Like I talked about the little sparrows. I see the birds all around, always eating. God is much greater than that. He's driven by his compassion for his people. That's his desire. He does. He does want to provide. Sometimes we just don't even ask. Because we'll do it ourselves. We can accomplish it ourselves. Or we have the answer in ourselves. Or there's some human person out there who has the answer, right? God has the answer. And they learned that. They would have to live by faith, completely, totally by faith, when the Lord left the planet. They'd have to live completely and totally by faith. Christ is our sufficiency in every area of our lives. Yeah. You know what? Let me, let me give you a real practical example. I know this is going to sound probably really dumb. But someone gave us a car. My sister looked at me. My, my youngest sister said, man, not one but two. Yeah, someone gave us a pickup, and I still have it. It was in very good condition. And then somebody gave me a car. It's not in very good condition. But there's a reason why I believe we have it. But I'm not a mechanic. I am a carpenter. They're very different, mechanics and carpenters. But my niece bought me a set of car, uh, mechanic tools, so I have some tools. So since it's kind of a junker, if I mess it up, oh well, right? So I'm learning. There was this difficult part that had to come out of the transmission, and I wasn't quite sure how to get it out. And I knew there was a bunch of people I could call, and I knew I could go on YouTube and learn. I wanted to. And I kind of messed with it all day trying to figure it out. And at the end of the day, I finally just said, Lord, what's the answer to this? 
there was an idea. Right, as soon as I prayed it, there was an idea on the top of my head. Right here, that transferred down to here. And as soon as the answer came, I did what, what the idea told me. I believe it was from the Lord because it came immediately after I asked. That part that I was worked on all day long trying to remove from the vehicle popped right out. Pop. And I remember years ago working on an old pickup I had the same way. I couldn't get a valve cover off. It had been there for 40 years, and I couldn't get it off. And then I just said, Lord, pop. It came off. Susan was praying for something specifically last week, something specifically. And within two days, the Lord answered it specifically. Specifically. Why? Because he cares. He cares that I work out there in that heat all day long. He just waits for me to ask. He's thinking, man, when's he going to ask me? When's he going to ask me? He does. He cares. And if he cares for our physical needs that much, how much more did he demonstrate his love and care for us spiritually? How did he demonstrate that? He poured himself out on the cross. Yeah. The Kabbalians were right. Those who lived in, in the area of the ten cities were right. He does all things well. Amen? Let's pray. Their heads bowed and their eyes closed, just kind of an extension of this, and then we'll pray. So much of the miraculous in our lives is not there because we depend so much on man. Man has gotten to a place now where he believes that he has a fix for everything. And the Lord just kind of takes a second, kind of takes a back seat forget that he's supposed to be in the driver's seat. He's supposed to be in the driver's seat. Not in the passenger seat, not in the back seat. Some of people put him in the trunk. He's supposed to be in the driver's seat. Where the Lord is the Lord right now in your life? Where is he? Is he on the throne or are you on the throne? Is he in the driver's seat or he's in the back seat? He's in the passenger seat? Where is he? Where is he in your life? Who, who or what is more significant to you than Christ? What sources are we going to for our sustenance? Emotional, spiritually, physical. I really believe that it, God can provide it all. Emotional stability. Physical stability. Financial stability. Spiritual stability. We're so quick to run for a human fix. We forget that he cares. He really cares. Nobody cares more than the Lord. Nobody cares more than God. Until you're in a position in life where you have nothing left but to look up, you'll never really know it. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you care. Sometimes we act as though we don't care about you because so many other things have priority over you. Help us to walk away today. Maybe there's a sense of conviction. That's good. Maybe there's a need to reprioritize and put you first again in our life. So many blessings you pour upon us and we take them and run away. So today, Lord, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, Maybe once again, just afresh and anew, refocus and understand how intimately you are concerned about our daily lives. And if you were here today, Lord, you'd be right in the middle of all of us doing the things that we do on the human level to show how much interest you have in us. May we return that attention to you. In Christ's name we pray.